favorite topics. I've lectured about this uh, throughout the years. Uh, I mentor my own students on the topic, and I think it's you know, just extremely relevant. It's, it's something that most people can connect with. Uh, as opposed to you know, a lot of this academic research we do that maybe six people in the world care about. I think most people actually care about things like freedom and privacy and how that affects them personally. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm grateful to you all for taking time this afternoon to uh, be here with us. Before I get into this, I think a, a little bit about me and a few disclosures is in order. It just helps you understand where I'm coming from. You know, a lot of academic discourse uh, you know, just, just helps know who it is you're talking to and where they're coming from ideologically if you're wanting to have an intelligent conversation about something. So I've done research in this area. I currently, uh, you know, I'm actively involved both academically and personally in uh, technology, privacy, and, and ethics. As an academic, I teach the topic. I've taught business ethics before. Uh, currently, I lecture on privacy and ethics in a few of the courses that I have back in the University of Canterbury. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm like most people in this room. I've grown up and lived all my life in uh, a free Western democracy, and uh, you know, just that's how I've spent my life. So I feel very fortunate uh, to live a life like that. Uh, if there's anybody in this room who has not had that privilege, I think you probably value freedom a little more especially than the rest of us do. Because I think most of us who live in a free society all our life, we tend to just take it for granted. That's the way the world's supposed to be. But uh, you, know, you really don't appreciate it uh, until you uh, until you, it affects you, until you uh, lose a little bit of it. So, welcome if you're here, and uh, I appreciate you coming to hear that. So, one of the things I like about technology and, and ethics is there's just an endless source of information about this. Every time I open up the newspaper, there's another article about new technology and uh, the obvious ethical implications of this technology. I used to try to plan this in advance when I'm doing this for my students. I like to give them a little rundown of what, what's happening in current events and all that stuff. And I used to try to stress about planning this. What am I going to do for my lecture next week? And it's at the point now where I don't even have to worry about it anymore. I pretty much trust that when I sit down and do my preps the day before class, there's almost always going to be something in the last few days that I can bring to class. No matter what the topic is, I can almost always find something. So rapid is the news stream on emerging technologies and, and ethics now. It's like having a smorgasbord to, to pick from. So you know, we're just never going to run out of, of information on this. I also <laughs> think I ought to disclose a little bit about what I believe about freedom and privacy before we talk, because I, I know that this is a very subjective and very personal topic. Everybody has their own beliefs about freedom. Declan and I were just talking about that, you know, you, you're not going to find anyone who says that I don't believe in it. You know, just about everybody is going to say, oh, yeah, of course I believe. But you know, I know that everybody's got their own ideas and beliefs about what it is and what it means to them personally. So I just wanted to disclose a little bit about myself and what I believe. I think it's mostly rooted in the concept of self-ownership. And uh, what we call freedom and privacy, I think, traces back to this idea that we, we own ourselves. Uh, we, you know, we don't belong to other people. Nobody ought to, in our most natural state, ought to rule over us or be able to tell us what to do. And this is most uh, accurately reflected in John Locke, it's one of my philosophical heroes, that, who says that every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. And you know, if you think about the logical implications of that, you know, it basically extends to the things that we 
you know, the things that we do, the things that we think, the way we live our lives. Because the next <laughs> statement that he makes is that uh, the labor of his body, the work of his hands, we may say are properly his. So it's not just the ownership of ourselves, but the things that we make, the things that we do also belong to us. So if our, if our freedom and our free will is rooted in the ownership of ourselves, the ownership of our own thoughts, and our own, the own work of our hands, well, you know, this is what our technology is. We made this stuff and we use this stuff. And we make our own choices about what we're going to do with it. We own it, in other words. As much as we own ourselves, we own the things that we make and we own the things that, that, that we do. So when I talk about freedom and privacy and free will, I mean, this is the ideological background that I'm coming from. And I'm perfectly aware that there's, you know, debate on this and other people have their own concepts about that. And we'll have question and answer afterwards and we can talk about that as, as well. So anyway, I'm wrapping up a five-week visit here in, in Ireland, and I feel very fortunate to have been here during the time when you're celebrating the 100-year uh, anniversary of the 1916 Rising. And one of the things that I, you know, I have been able to observe firsthand in my five weeks here is just how much the Irish value their freedom. And it's kind of refreshing to see a culture and a nation that, that cares uh, so deeply about that. One of, the, one of the best things that I did this month was I attended a, uh, a service at St. Patrick's just this Sunday, which was a special service for the, uh, the people who gave their lives in the 1916 Rising for yeah, for the freedom of Ireland. It's just a beautiful service. The, the choir uh, sung a requiem for them. I just remember sitting there thinking that, you know, I just love being here in Ireland and being immersed in all of this. And I just appreciate what the Irish people have gone through to get to this, this state. So, I think that I see eye to eye with most of you on, uh, you know, what we're talking about here. Um, and if we, we don't, that's fine. I mean, you know, I, I acknowledge that this is a very subjective topic and uh, a topic that each of us makes our own. We all make our own decisions and we all uh, exercise our freedom in our own way. That's just the way that our Western society is made up. So anyway, uh, I would argue based on, uh, you know, following up on Locke's reasoning that, yeah, we, we make this technology our own, and it's not just in, a, in an ideological sense that we do this, that, you know, I own this, I'm making my own decisions. But the neuroscience research also demonstrates that when we use a technology, when we make a tool, physiologically our brains actually treat it as if it's a member of our own body. And there's actual neuroscience research to back this up. So it's as though you grew a new limb on your body when you're using, when you're using a tool. So it's not just that we make these tools and make them our own. Our brain, according to the neuroscientists, say that it's, it's plastic. This is uh, neuroplasticity, where our brains actively adapt to all these things that we do, and in a very physiological and real sense, these things we make our own just by our adopting them and by our using them. Okay? Let's talk about some of these technologies. I rounded up a few. You know, I just pulled these up, most of them, in the last week. Like I said, I didn't have to prep this week in advance. Some of these are just a, a few days or a few weeks old. So we're going to talk about some of these technological tools, and I'm going to raise a few issues throughout uh, the, the remainder of, of our time today. We're going to talk about what the modern research is saying about some of uh, the ethical implications or the, uh, what the research helps us shed light on uh, based on you know, our knowledge of how we work and how we think about this. So this is just 
on an article, Pentagon research could make a brain modem a reality. What they're working on is a piece of technology that is a high bandwidth network interface that you could just stick in somebody's brain. This is what the Pentagon's working on. Now, if you read this article, it will say that, well, it's in very developmental stages. It's, we really don't have a timeline for this. Of course, these are Department of Defense people you're talking to, so you don't really know how far along it is, but I do know how far along uh, some of this other research is, and I do know that, that they're thinking it's just on the news. Uh, a couple weeks ago, they had a guy who was a quadriplegic, and you know, looked like something out of science fiction. They had the guy wired up, wires coming out of his head, and something that was attached to his arm, and he was just thinking, and his arm was moving. This guy's quadriplegic, okay? So I know they're doing other stuff like this. And uh, I've seen other, I could round up a, a slew of other articles for you that uh, demonstrates it. Yeah, the technology is real. It's not science fiction anymore, although just 10 years ago, if you were to tell me that we would be doing even this simple stuff, I think I would have said, well, that's just kind of a pipe dream. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Not in 10 years, but here we are. In 10 years, we're talking about this. And, the Pentagon's talking about putting modems in soldiers' brains so they can control uh, you know, various things that soldiers need to control, like battlefield stuff. So there's that. This other one right here, the Google DeepMind Artificial Intelligence beats the world's best Go player, Lee Sedol, in a landmark game. Right? One of the little lines in this was that they didn't expect a computer to be able to be a Go player for at least another 10 years. This is one of the points they make in this particular article. For anybody who's ever tried to play Go, you understand this. It's not at all like playing chess. It's a very, it's a strategic game. The rules are very simple. And it involves a lot of stuff that's, you know, real expert behavior that is very uniquely human. That uh, machines aren't supposed to be able to do this very well. Okay. Yet we have artificial intelligence that is beating a human master at what many experts think is probably the most strategic, the most human, the hardest strategic game there is, Go. So I don't want this to look like, well, this is just a game that they play. Go is not just a game, but then you all are playing that. I've tried it. I'm not good. I, I couldn't do that. Um, but anyway, here's where we are with artificial intelligence. So we have a computer that's actually able to think at the human level in strategic terms. And again, this is just one article. I could have chosen a, a handful of others. I think most of you might have heard about IBM's Watson computer winning a game of Jeopardy against Jeopardy champions, which was no small feat either. So you know, artificial intelligence is another field that's in development. Now we also have a lot of surveillance and monitoring technology that's on the horizon. This one is Facebook is watching and tracking you more than you probably realize. Well, we all knew this, okay? I mean, this is this not, uh, you know, a great revelation. I think it's in the news enough that uh, you know, we know what they're doing. Uh, Facebook gives you a free account, basically, because you're the product. <laughs> You know, if you're not paying for something, you're the product. They just want the information that you're providing them, and Facebook uses that information. Uh, a few years back, we were uh, talking about knowledge management in the field of information systems. And uh, it had some issues studying that, some problems with conceptualizing you know, what's the difference between knowledge and information, and what exactly is a knowledge management system, how is it different from an information system. And you don't hear a whole lot about knowledge management anymore. There's still people doing research in that area. But really what I think has happened is that the entire community has just moved on because social networks have kind of accepted the pragmatic position that, OK, we can't build a knowledge management system the way everybody thinks we can build a knowledge management system. We can't just take the knowledge out of people's brains and put it in the system. So, We'll do the next best thing. We'll just make the people part of the system. So that's kind of where we're at with uh, Facebook. And they've taken that concept and they just run with it. So everything you do, they're just scooping the data off the internet and uh, they're doing all kinds of deep 
analysis with it, part of it with some of the artificial intelligence that is uh, uh, being developed, uh, natural language processing, sentiment analysis. There's a whole bunch of fields of artificial intelligence that can be applied to just the trivial little data that people generate by terabytes in their uh, Facebook accounts, like likes and the number of comments, <laughs> all the little things people are basically documenting and journaling their lives on Facebook, all for free. And uh, you know, that data that you agreed when you decided you were going to use Facebook, you agreed to their terms of service. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, Facebook's got a really good case saying, hey, you know, we own all this information. You signed the terms of service and uh, we're going to do what we want with it. So there's that. Just so you think I'm not picking on, uh, or I'm solely picking on business, there's also this. You know, I think everybody knows who that is. Uh, government's got a big interest in surveillance and monitoring, and they're using any and all data that's at their disposal also. And, um, uh, so that's not uh, enough. Uh, there's also a lot of these businesses that have very strong uh, would almost say cozy and friendly relationships with government too. So it's not just business and not just government. I mean, we also have this hybrid of the two where they're very close with each other and collaborating and uh, who knows what's going on there. It's like all these discussions happen out of the sight of the public. And I wonder if that was part of the terms of service that you agreed to when you signed up with Facebook. So you have that to think about as well. And you know, I just, sometimes I just, I just love academia because I feel like a kid in a candy shop. I mean, I'm an adult who gets to talk about robots all the time. And you know, here we've got, uh, you know, robots is another big issue that's on the horizon. And uh, this, we will all have personal robot assistants within the next decade. So, I don't know if it's a decade or 15 or 20 years or five years, you know, but uh, they're, they're actually making robots that, that do this kind of stuff. It's not too hard to find articles out there now where uh, the manufacturers are reporting their initial successes with various aspects of robotics technology. And some of these robots are very believable. They're still in their early stages. But 10 years from now, uh, you might be sitting there listening to Robot Windgreen deliver uh, you know, a lecture instead of me in person. And uh, well, I'll be off doing, a, you know, I'll be on a beach somewhere. Who knows? I mean, or maybe I'll be just uh, in my home hidey hole feeling kind of useless because the world would rather talk to my robot than me. But this is something that's uh, at stake here. Uh, this movie, this picture is from a movie called Hurt. And if you haven't seen that movie, I recommend it. It's just an outstanding movie. And that's Joaquin Phoenix. And the movie is about, okay, they got a new operating system, the latest, greatest new operating system out there. It's, it's uh, got its own personality. It's your operating systems. It's like an artificial intelligent assistant. Okay, and he gets his upgrade, and uh, his assistant asked him a few questions, and then it configured itself, and it was Scarlett Johansson, what do you know? So uh, he fell in love with his, his operating system, and the movie's about all the changes that are happening to him as he gets attached to his operating system. I, I don't know if any of you had the latest version of Windows. There's something on there called Siri. I'm not Siri, Cortana. Siri's the other one. It's got Cortana on it, which is supposed to be kind of like the early phases of this right here. Well, by the end of the movie, um, you know, him being a tech guy was never all that socially adept, so he gets very attached to his computer, and then he goes on dates with other people who are dating their operating systems. So they have, they have this. It's, it's a great movie. I don't want to give away too much, but I just want to whet your appetite for that. I recommend the movie to you, so go see it for yourself, and I think you'll appreciate it. Not too many spoilers here. So you got robots and robot assistants, things like that that we have to worry about. Before I get into the, the issues, there are two sets of assumptions I want to talk about. If we want to talk about ethics, something that's very deeply personal to most people, we need to talk about 
things like anthropological assumptions. And by that, I mean our assumptions about human nature, who we are as people. Because whatever we believe about human nature is going to affect uh, the way we interact with technology and the way we form ethical beliefs about the technology. All right? Basically, do we believe people are basically morally good and decent and honest? Uh, I know some people believe that is kind of like a core assumption. Very, I have a positive outlook about humanity, and others have a, a bit darker view of humanity. Humanity is basically broken and kind of dark and corrupt. Uh, maybe it's neither of those. Maybe it's something a little more complex than that. But my point is, is that you have to think about what our anthropological assumptions are before we start talking about ethics and ethical implications, because what you believe about that is going to be affected by what you believe about people. Because remember, um, back a few slides ago, I was talking about how John Locke basically says that uh, you know all the, the the stuff that we do, you know, the work of our hands. <coughs> the, the labor that we do, this properly belongs to us. We make it our own. So you can make the argument that when we're talking about technology, freedom, and privacy, we're really not talking about these three things, but we're really talking about ourselves when we do this because this is, this is our property. We own this as much as we own ourselves, according to John Locke. We own this stuff. So, are there two human natures or one, or is there something more complex than that? Another question you might ask is, is the technology itself amoral or agnostic? Or, when we build things, when we make things, and when we use things, do we impart a little piece of us along with it? And if we do, then maybe it's not amoral or agnostic. It's possible. Um, certainly in the way we use technology, I, I, I could make that connection. But, uh, you know, if you believe the research talk about, you know, tool making and tool usage and how our brains adapt to this, you know, it's not that much of a stretch to think that, yeah, maybe we do impart a little bit of ourselves with technology. Maybe we shouldn't be treating technology like it's just an agnostic, amoral tool, or morally neutral, okay? So that's the first set of assumptions. The second set of assumptions are basic empirical assumptions. Um, the, the empirical paradigm has so deeply steeped itself in Western culture that most of us don't even realize that uh, our thinking and the way we live our lives essentially like a, is, is bound to this way of thinking, we don't even realize it. Uh, you know, we have to have objective evidence. We have to have measurements and controls before we actually know something. And you know, this is fine. I mean, I kind of earned my own stripes as an empirical researcher, and this is what academics have to do. You, you, you follow the empirical method, you develop theories, and you test hypotheses, and you pop out results, and voila, new knowledge has been created, right? Well, the empirical method assumes certain things about measurements and controls and, and methods. And we almost unwillingly kind of adopt this, this mode of thinking that uh, you know, when we try to find out the truth of something, we can't really know it unless we have some empirical evidence for it. Okay? Now, that might be fine for a lot of the sciences. They, uh, particularly the harder sciences seem to work very well that way. But ethics is not a hard science. Human nature is not a hard science. So they don't lend themselves as easily to empirical methods as the others do. So that's a, an assumption that we need to be aware of, because I'll be talking about some issues. In a, a, the next few slides, I'll raise five different issues about these technologies. And uh, the, possible to argue that, well, there's not a whole lot of empirical evidence for that wind green. What? That's just your opinion. But uh, I think most people 
thinking about this stuff would see that, well, okay, maybe there's no empirical evidence for it, but I've certainly observed that with Facebook users or with people who use a GPS and drive it into a lake because the GPS told them to go there, you know? So it's, maybe there's no empirical evidence. It might be mostly anecdotal, but uh, the empirical paradigm might not allow us to admit some of this, but we know it's, there's some truth about that. If it's not truth, the truth is something like that. All right? So those are the two sets of assumptions that we should keep in mind before we get into the nuts and uh, guts of all this. So the first question, free will. <coughs> really, do we have it at all, or is it just an illusion? There is some research out there where they're trying to suggest that we really don't have free will. I mean, they do uh, experiments, and they uh, some scientists <coughs> believe that we're, you know, the decisions we make are who we are, the things we do, really just the product of all these multitudes of variables about our upbringing, about our genes, our genetic makeup, all this stuff. And we don't know it, but we're just a slave to all these other factors. We can't help the decisions that we make because it's all determined by these forces that are acting on us. So human behavior is kind of like, uh, almost like one of these, these uh, push button machines. It's got a black box, you push the button and something pops out the other end. Well, human beings, these forces act on our inputs and out pops a behavior out the other end or a decision is made based on that. So some people believe that. They think that it's, it's just an illusion that we treat ourselves with uh, caused by the fact that we're allowed to make decisions or we think we make decisions so we think we have free will. So, I mean, that's what they say. I personally don't agree with that. But uh, this is what the research says. Well, anyway, consider this now. Here's what the technology uh, is about in this area. This is uh, an article about two scientists who implanted a false memory into a mouse. All right? Uh, basically made the mouse remember something that didn't happen. Now, this is an empirical study. They had a lot of controls, just like good empirical studies go. And, uh, well, okay, it seems to kind of support this idea that, well, maybe you can stimulate neural inputs and create memories of people. And maybe, maybe at least this mouse doesn't have a free will, and maybe they can do the same thing to humans. They're working on this technology. This is not the only one in this, this area that I come up with. There are others. Um, <coughs> this one right here, you know, think the mouse experiment was, you know, well that's just a mouse, it's just maybe they planted a mouse memory in there. Look at this one. This guy's wearing a, a helmet thing with wires coming out of it. And what they did is they stimulated an area of his brain. They studied how brains work. Uh, particularly how uh, the brains of airplane, airplane pilots work. And they learned how they work when they're acquiring new skills. And they put this helmet on, and uh, it's almost like a science fiction movie when I was a kid. They had to you put the helmet on with the wires coming out of it, and they beam some stuff in there. But this, uh, the people who participated in this experiment uh, were 33% better at learning piloting skills as a result of this. So, okay, did they put information into the person's brain or did they just stimulate an area of the brain? I don't know, know how that worked. Who knows? Or does it even matter uh, that they were able to do this? The uh, fact is, is that they did something to the person's brain and, you know, the people were 33% better at learning pilot skills. That's the result of that. So, I kind of like this one too because but the thought occurred to me as I read this that, you know, if, if you wanted to protect yourself from that, you probably really would need to wear a tinfoil hat <laughs> to keep yourself from having that, this make an effect. But anyway, so there is that. Issue number two, the privacy paradox. The privacy paradox is basically this. <laughs> Everybody loves privacy. Everybody says they value privacy. But why do they do things that give away their privacy? 
This is a paradox. This is like the empirical scientist's way of saying, we can't explain this. Our theory says that these people should care about their privacy, yet they go on Facebook and Twitter and tweet the most intimate details of their personal lives and you know, document their entire lives on Facebook, even though they say they value their privacy. It's a paradox. <laughs> so empirical research is not really that well able to explain this. There are some possible explanations out there for this, but uh, you know, it's not too hard to uh, find evidence to support this. And I think most people in this room know that there's something to this, even if I can't give you an empirical evidence and uh, maybe empirical, and you know how empirical evidence goes. There's all these things that could happen. We control certain factors and we really just isolated one effect. And I could show you that empirical research and, and a skeptic would just say, yeah, but it's just that one effect, wind green, there's all these other things going on, that's why you're wrong, you didn't account for all this other stuff too. So just kind of to illustrate one of my earlier statements that empirical science really doesn't lend itself very well to studying ethical belief systems and ethical value systems and how people put together their, uh, their beliefs in the areas of privacy, freedom, and uh, technology like this. So here's one. It's just a recent article about, uh, well, this one's not as, as recent. It's just a Facebook privacy paradox that's uh, talking about why people share intimate details of their lives in Facebook so they know it's out there. Here's another one that I thought was interesting. <coughs> a brain decoder can eavesdrop on your inner voice, okay? Sometimes when you're thinking about something, you kind of think in phrases and you're trying to think of something to say and you think in words. Well, this thing, they've taught this thing how to decode the words that you're saying to yourself in your own inner voice. When you're thinking about these words, the thing can pick it out of your head. Okay? Well, what was what's the most private place in the universe might not be so private anymore. And on that nature, right here I want to talk about William James. It's a bit of a lengthy quote, but uh, there, I think it's important that you should you should hear this because I really <coughs> like William James's thoughts on this, on privacy in our minds. He says, each of these minds keeps its own thoughts to itself, meaning our minds, your minds, and my minds. There is no giving or bartering between them. No thought even comes into direct sight of another thought in another personal consciousness than its own. Absolute insulation, irreducible pluralism is the law. It seems as if the elementary psychic fact were not thought or this thought or that thought, but my thought. Every thought being owned. Neither contemporaneity nor proximity in space nor similarity of quality and content are able to fuse together thoughts which are sundered by this barrier of belonging to different personal minds. The breaches between such thoughts are the most absolute breaches in nature. In other words, he believes that your mind is more or less the most private place in the universe, and yet here we've got technology that can now eavesdrop on what used to be, and I think for now still is, I mean, unless I, they've got something I don't know about, but who knows where it's going to be in 10 years. I mean, I know right now it might be hard to do that, but 10 years from now, all bets are off. Things that I believed 10 years ago, they've already invented technology doing all this stuff. So, anyway, issue three, fitting in. This is another thing we need to think about because, okay, something's really only outrageous the first time it happens. We see something, it's like there's no way you're putting that chip in my head. Well, okay, the first time it happens, Fine. Second time, third time, it's like, well, okay, I don't like it, but if you want to do it, that's fine. You know? And after a while, it's like uh, all your friends are coming to you. It's like, hey, Wingry, I got a chip version 3.1, you know, and what's taking you so long, man? I want to share my thoughts with you. So, I mean, how long, uh, how long are you going to be able to resist? There's, the, the human tendency is to want to fit in. Charles Darwin observed this uh, in his 
origin of the species, that biological organisms is basically what we do. We adapt. And humans are particularly good at this. We don't just adapt. We're one of the few animals on this earth that actually recreates our environment. We create the world that we live in. So we're not just good at adapting. We're good at making things happen that we want to happen. So very adaptive and very flexible. What this means is that when we want to fit in, we'll find a way to fit in. Um, in modern psychology, there's a lot of research in this area. Person environment fit, person organization fit, person job fit. I've done research on both person organization and person job fit because I'm a, a business scholar. And I study decision science. We'll get to talk a little bit about that later. Um, fit researchers often mention the need to account for value judgments, but uh, you know, it's too hard to do it empirically. So they just like, well, we need to do this. And you know, at the end of all our papers, we talk about future research. Future research ought to do, ought to look at value judgments and assess the goodness of fit or the badness of fit. And then it just gets forgotten because it's just too hard to do. I mean, you can't control that kind of thing empirically, or it's very difficult to do. And the kinds of studies that are out there. It might be good studies, but they're just studying one tiny little aspect of it. They're really not capturing the fullness of, of fit. And it's part of some of the research that, I, that I've done. I've tried to expand it a little bit to include a few things. And it's, it's a bit of a dirty little in-house secret among fit researchers that people, people try to fit in regardless of whether it's, it's a good or a bad thing. In other words, it might go contrary to their beliefs and values. And yet they'll still try to do it because their friends are doing it or because it's going to help them get a promotion or because it's going to, that's what it takes to get the job done, um, that kind of thing. So that, it's kind of an issue because a lot of this technology presents itself to us. And at first, we might have this reverse reaction. But over time, our human nature kicks in. We just want to adapt. We want to find a way of making it work. We want to find a way to Either we get tired of our friends bugging us about it, or we have seen it enough that it's not so scary anymore, and you know, we just decide, well, OK, I'll do it. Kind of like you remember the first time you uh, did online banking. I think most people remember that and kind of skeptical, but I think almost everybody does it now. So there's that. Uh, Nicholas Carr on this topic and uh, writes in two books, The Shallows and the Glass Cage discusses uh, some of the uh, neuroscience research about how we create technology to alleviate our burdens, but our technology also becomes a part of us, kind of like we were um, making uh, an argument for back with John Locke. It makes changes to our brain physiology and our psychological makeup. He distinguishes between ordinary tools and intellectual tools. Well. Uh, we know what ordinary tools do, like you know, tools for manual labor. We kind of get a little weaker when we use these. We're not as, as strong and able body as we used to be. It's not so clear what intellectual tools will do to us, because the part of our body that intellectual tools are supposed to be replacing is our brain. <laughs> so what happens when you outsource your, your brain to some kind of intellectual tool? I don't know. For my part, I used to be really good at remembering phone numbers. Now, but now that I have technological applications where I have them all stored, I'm just, it's like, why bother? You know, and uh, uh, technological tools for GPS now. Some people can't, you know, find their way out of a phone booth now because they're so reliant on GPS technologies. Uh, so who, who knows what the long-term implications of this are? Here's some uh, thoughts, modern technology and fitting in. You know anybody who's kind of depressed because all their friends are more popular on Facebook? I mean, how can you be depressed when you have 10,000 friends and a million likes on Facebook? You know, how does that happen? The research seems to indicate that people desperately want to fit in. They want to be liked by their peer groups, so they put all this stuff up. Uh, to be liked and to be accepted, and when their friends don't like it or don't like it as much, you know, the depression sets in, or so goes the theory, anyway. 
Here's another one right here. Robots take 50% of our jobs by 2050 uh, and might outperform humans in almost anything. Well, okay. Um, thinking about as nice as it would be to have robot Wimbreen stand in line uh, uh, you know, to buy tickets or stand in line at the grocery store. I'm kind of wondering uh, how good an idea that would be when people begin to like robot Wimbreen better than they like me. And uh, how am I going to fit in when all this starts happening? What's my place in society? What's my place in my social group going to be like? And it's not just robots, but a lot of people have online identities that aren't necessarily their own identities. They, the, the personas they put up on Facebook, their avatars that they have on various social media sites. You know, so a lot of this stuff has an effect on us, but it's being driven primarily by our need as human beings or our instincts as human beings to adapt and to fit in. Okay, so that's another issue that we need to think about going forward. I've also done a little bit of research on this, and so I can talk about my own research, not just other people's research. Uh, we found a strong relationship between perceived fit with the ethical climate and organizational commitment. Uh, one of the unreported findings in this study is that there was a very strong relation between convenience fit, which is like fit because it's just convenient for me, and the motivation to fit, and organizational commitment. So in other words, people aren't very motivated to fit in when fit is poor and it's without consideration of a good or bad ethical climate. We used, as most fit research does, a, a completely amoral fit instrument. We weren't trying to uh, decide whether people thought the fit was a good idea or a bad idea. This is kind of common in the fit uh, research area. They just don't want to deal with issues of morality and ethics and stuff like that. So they use this nice, clean, sterile, amoral fit instrument. Okay, so we looked at convenience fit and we found, uh, you know, a high correlation with organizational commitments uh, and, uh, you know, also motivation, motivation fit. So basically people's, people consider convenience They'll fit out of convenience in many cases, not because it's good or bad or because they agree or disagree with it. Um, ethical values are also strongly related to commitment to one's organization. That's another finding of this study. So you know, what people value might have as much to do with what their organization values as what, what they value. That's kind of like the definition of what organizational fit is. So maybe it's not about what the person believes, but uh, you know what, I like my job, I want to do a good job, and to do the best job I can possibly do, I have to fit in. Even if I don't agree with all these principles, I'm going to do that. Or because I'm going to do it because it's convenient as well. So our findings suggest that people's ethical beliefs and values are adaptable according to the demands of the local climate, of the local context. Here's one. I just thought I'd throw this in here. Okay, mind reading technology can reconstruct faces from the viewer's brain. And I saw this, I'm like, whoa, you know, just couldn't believe what I was seeing here. This is a, this is the original picture right here, and people in this experiment were asked to think about this picture, right? So this is the original picture, and these are the computer reconstructed pictures from, you know, I guess maybe they put the same helmet on with all the wires coming out or something. I don't know uh, the details now. They can't recall that, but they were able to read things in people's minds, brain signals that allowed them to reconstruct the faces that they were thinking about in their minds. Okay. So this is uh, on the top, the next topic, issue five, ethics in, in context. So there's that. Which brings me to my next study, ethical value systems for personal information privacy. This is another piece of research that we're doing. Now just think about that technology, about reaching into people's minds and pulling out pictures of people's faces like that while I talk about this. So what we did was we compared ethical value systems for personal 
information privacy between the use of personal information in social networks and the use of personal information for business purposes, okay? We thought, okay, modern ethical theory, it's, it's not all that, that complex. Uh, for personal information privacy, they think that people are basically fundamentalists about privacy or they're unconcerned about privacy. This is from a guy named Weston, who's been the predominant uh, mover in the field of personal information privacy. Uh, Weston thought it was invariant. In other words, these are people's beliefs. It doesn't change from one context to the next. Um, you know, people have ethical beliefs. They're somewhere on this spectrum of, you know, fundamentalists who are unconcerned about personal information privacy. Uh, our preliminary results, however, identified three different types of ethical value systems. So it turns out that there really isn't a single continuum of beliefs about personal information privacy, but there's different belief systems about personal information privacy. And second of all, it changed from context to context. So this is kind of interesting because it turns out, if, if you take this to its next logical step, that maybe people don't really have one value system for their ethics. Maybe they have multiple value systems that depends on the context. We like to think of ourselves as having this integrated, coherent set of beliefs and values, but how I mean, we observed it was very easy in a research setting to get people to change their beliefs between contexts. They might be you know, a fundamentalist in one context and a pragmatist in another context. And uh, what this suggests is either people have different belief systems for different contexts, or they have one belief system that manifests different subsystems in different contexts. Either way, it's not quite as easy as, as we thought. And this also kind of jives along with that whole fitting in thing. You know, our, our ethical beliefs and values kind of adapt themselves depending on what we're encountering at, at the moment. And at first, that doesn't sound too, too radical, but, you know, for some people in the field of ethics and privacy, that's a bit, a bit radical and it kind of ruffles a few feathers for people who want to make some kind of universal framework for ethics. Okay, so I, I don't, I'm not bothered by this, you know? grown very skeptical of the empirical paradigm, as I've said. I don't think the empirical paradigm is the best for studying ethics. And what I'm seeing is that I think everybody basically has their own subjective ethical system in place. And I'm fine with that. I mean, you know, if I believe in freedom and free will, then I have to believe that, you know, people are free to make their own beliefs and their own systems that don't agree with mine. And you know, that's really, uh, you know, I'd be a hypocrite otherwise if I said, I'm free, 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 and no, you can't believe like that because that's not the way things work. So I was a bit encouraged by that. Just so you know, the way we define value systems for uh, this study is a set of priorities that defines the relative importance of things. So we're just putting away the empirical model. We're not trying to control all these variables so we can look at just one. We're assuming that the entire field of ethical beliefs interacts with all other elements in that field. So it's a coherent set of beliefs that's all interacting. We're not even attempting to isolate one belief from another belief, okay? So it's a set of priorities that defines the relative importance of things. By definition, a value system seeks to explain the relative importance of things and uh, therefore, the value of any given thing is an assessment of its uh, subjective relative importance to all other things. So they not only uh, explain anomalies within their own established set of rules, but they explain away contradictions as well. I think we've seen this where you present somebody with a fact or a piece of information that doesn't sit too well with their belief system. And what do you know? Their belief system explains it away very nicely. It's like, well, you have not shaken me from my beliefs. All you've done is find this curious little exception that I can explain away. And this is how people work. So, uh, and it's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining about that. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm a realist when it comes to human nature. 
can accept people with all their warts and flaws, and this is the way people work. They don't behave the way empirical scientists want them to behave. All right. So, in summary, I've shown you, uh, given you my own beliefs about freedom, privacy, and ethics, talked about a few assumptions, shown you a bunch of technologies that, you know, I think we really need to think about here. And it's not just not just uh, that we need to reach an agreement on what to do with all these things, because there's no one answer to any of this. I think each person, because if you believe ethical belief systems and freedom and privacy is a deeply subjective and personal thing, you have to believe that each person is going to make up their own mind about this, and each person has to be engaged on the topic, and each person has to uh, you know, make their own decisions on what they think is going to be important. We've got a lot of different technologies, biotechnologies like chip implants, surveillance technologies, things that we need to think about, cultural and social norms. Um, you know, another thing I think we all uh, need to be aware of is, is that uh, you know, this whole privacy paradox thing where we just keep giving away information. Uh, without even thinking about the implications of, of that. Uh, you know, it's not necessary to pass laws to strip citizens of their privacy if the citizens by precedent are already just giving it away. And it's kind of hard to make that argument. You know, you shouldn't be collecting this information. And, uh, the, you know, Facebook just says, well, hey, you know, people give it to us for free, man. We're not forcing them to do this. So I mean, they're doing it of their own free will. And, uh, you know, if you believe in free will, you know, I do, but I, I already showed you that not everybody does believe in free will. Some people think that we make decisions uh, kind of like captive to all the forces and things that act on us. So business has some legitimate interests in all these technologies and uh, our freedoms and privacy. Marketing, product design, customer relationships. I, ask my own students this, when is it an ethical use of your personal information? And they'll all give me their examples and we'll summarize that. Well, basically what it turns out is it's ethical when it benefits me and it's unethical when it doesn't. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you make, what do you do with that? And every, what's more is everybody has their own subjective beliefs about ethics too. So each person has what's ethical to me because it benefits me is not ethical to you because it doesn't benefit you. So there's that. We also have government. It's got very strong interests in this area also. Uh, you know, state security, bureaucratic efficiency, uh, fairness and justice, all these things that government does for us, uh, presumably in the common good. And uh, we support a lot of this stuff because uh, you know, we see it's, it's pretty good for society, but I think uh, a lot of the uh, unintended consequences uh, we don't, don't realize until it's too late. So we were just talking, uh, Declan and I, over a cup of coffee a couple of hours ago that, well, it's kind of wonderful that health and applications that help you monitor your health and calorie intake and calorie burning and all that, what happens the day when you open up your refrigerator and you, you take a cheeseburger out of the refrigerator and your refrigerator says, uh, you know, your doctor says you shouldn't be doing that and the health department's not going to uh, fund your treatments if you keep eating like this. So, you know, just, just think about the implications uh, down the road for this. Max Weber, the philosopher, argues that something is a state if and insofar as its administrative staff successfully upholds a claim on the monopoly of a legitimate use of physical force in the enforcement of its order. And we also have to think about business-government collaborations, like I said earlier. Now, uh, Weber points out, you know, one of the big differences between business and government, business can't force you to do anything can't force you to buy their product, they can cajole you and coerce you, but they can't force you to do that. When the state comes knocking at your door, you got to do it. You don't have a choice. You know, we got this law, and if you want to be a good citizen, you could do it, Green. fall in line. Snap two. So, 
we got a few things to think about. I mean, I uh, have tried to outline some of the issues and giving you a little bit of theory as background for that. And I want to just wrap up with a thought that I began with. John Locke says, every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. That's all I have.